morning again. Uh, yeah, it's uh, not such a good morning. We um, had an opportunity to mess around back there yesterday, and uh, this morning I made one wrong connection and uh, pulling out my hair. Thankfully, I had a haircut, so there weren't that many hair left to be pulling out. But um, anyhow, um, let me pray before we begin this morning. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here. We thank you, Lord, for the weather, whether it be sunny or rainy, Lord. We know that your purpose and your plan is being accomplished by whatever it is that is going on around us. I pray that you would allow our hearts to be settled and for your words to settle into our hearts, Lord God, and allow us to grow and thrive, bearing fruits in our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we often go to church, we also think about heaven and what that is. And so I began to um, um, read more about what Jesus is talking about, heaven, and what that might look like. And um, it is really interesting to me as I'm going through all of this again, seeing how Jesus is describing heaven um, not as a place, but oftentimes as individuals, as people, and how situations are being resolved. Um, uh, so he's giving a glimpse of heaven not as a place, but how uh, things are, are done um, and how perhaps maybe we as Christians should approach uh, heaven not as a place, but heaven as um, how we should approach uh, different um, adversities in life, perhaps. Um, this parable here talks about the tares versus the wheat. Um, or in some version talks about weed, but um, and many biblical scholars um, uh, can refer this back to, and even non-biblical scholars. There are a lot of uh, studies in um, just regular uh, scholastics in universities and so on and so forth, uh, talks uh, they, where they wanted to find out more about this tear. They want to understand what it is, and they have attributed it to um, this weed grass called um, darnel. Uh, and darnel is a um, is very similar to wheat when they grow. I'm not really sure if everybody has already uh, known about this. this. This has been talked about for for a very long time. Uh, tares or darnel and wheat used to be a a, a big thing back in um, the Romans' day during Jesus' time, um, and even further back, they have even discovered uh, Egyptian stores of uh, wheat. Um, and uh, they were able to find Darnell in them. And uh, it was speculated way back then that Darnell is poisonous. And so during some of these um, scientific dis um, investigations, what they did is they took a horse and they fed him 4.4 pounds. They keep on increasing the dosing <laughs> to see uh, how, how much it would it take to actually put down a horse by simply feeding him Darnell. And it took him 4.4 pounds of Darnell before the horse died of poisoning. And so um, there has been great interest in terms of Darnell because the mode of toxicity is not really known. Um, it was suspected way back then in Jesus' time and maybe throughout the Middle Ages is that uh, perhaps Darnell is poisonous. Um, the literature back in those days do say that it is noxious and toxic to animals and human. And they, they thought that maybe by cooking it that um, maybe that toxicity will go away. How, um, so what they did is that they actually took some Darnell, you know, in Europe, in the Middle Ages, they took some Darnell and they actually made beer out of it. Um, and it gives them a, a somewhat of a, um, um, you know, a, a heady kind of, a, um, um, you know, unlike other beers, <laughs> I guess. What is it? Uh, it is, yeah. It, it does ha have ha hallucinogenic uh, properties to it. So that was not explainable because, um, you know, they, they didn't really know where that came from. So actually it came from a fungus that actually um, live inside uh, the, or I, wouldn't, I, I shouldn't use the word live, but it, uh, it co-inhabit inside the seed of Darnell. And so that's what's giving rise to this hallucinogenic uh, property. It's actually a, a neurotoxin. Given enough of it, it actually will depress your respiratory rate and people, have, there have not been a, a recorded case of people dying from eating Darnell. 
but uh, people do have a uh, hallucinogenic effect, and uh, if enough of it is ingested, actually their respiratory um, rate will actually decrease. It's also causing vascular uh, constrictions, meaning your blood vessels constricts, um, and so on and so forth. And so this is actually a neurotoxin, actually uh, um, impacted your, uh, your nervous system. Anyways, uh, those things are very interesting to me personally. I don't know if it's interesting to anyone else, but I didn't want to kind of find out a little bit more about this Darnell, this tear that is being spoken about in the Bible. Um, and, um, and, and to try to understand it uh, that way a little bit. So in terms of the wheat and the tares being growing up together, they look very similar to each other. The height of the plants are very similar to each other. And so you can't really tell until when the, um, the, the, the what is called as flowering, when the seeds start to come out that you start to know. So when Darnell, when it's young, uh, it still has the same color the wheat would wheat, but it has a different formation when you know when wheat forms it has sort of like this symmetrical uh, sprout like that comes out whereas darnell has an asymmetrical uh, pattern to it so you can tell a little bit only when the flowering occur occurs so when when the uh, servants here as Jesus was talking about this the servant only realizes that darnell is growing or tear is growing in the field along with the wheat is when it's already at that stage right right before the harvest is occurring so we're talking about in the old days uh, or in um, on in the days of Jesus, a harvest usually happens around June to uh, August within that time frame somewhere around there. And so they have already been growing this for a good like six, seven months before that's happening. And so the, the, the servants are very shocked. It's like, oh my gosh, they've been taking care of this stuff that we shouldn't be, you know, harvesting and shouldn't be eating at all. But um, so the, the master, there, there are two, I'm, I'm just going to go to the, the point here. The master approaches it very, very differently than how we as, as, as people would approach it. And, you know, earlier this morning when I was trying to fix the, 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 the issues back there, um, I always have a tendency to go and say, try to see where the problem is and try to root it out and try to you know, essentially just yank it out. So um, we didn't have any audio, so I started pulling out all the audio, audio cables and try to remake them all. And, and just remaking all the wrong connections. <laughs> so it always ended up at the same exact location. But what is really interesting here is that in this particular um, passage, what we see is that the, the master approached problem very, very differently. He said, let both of them grow together, right? The approach of the servant is that, let us go out there and weed out all these tares, these darnels, these um, uh, mock weed that are, are, that are in the field because, you know, we shouldn't let them grow together. We should only keep the good one. We shouldn't allow both the bad one and good one to grow together. That's how we humans approach it. But what Jesus is saying here is that there is a different perspective from heaven. There is a different perspective that, that God looks at the problem of the world. And when we look at the world right now, one of the biggest things where we share the gospel to outsiders or non-believers, particularly those that have already been acquainted with Christianity, is that, you know, the problem with God and the, Christ, the, the problem with Christianity and the, the problem with looking at the world uh, with some sort of a deity controlling it is that there is an evil that exists in this world, and if there is a good God, then why does evil exist? And so, when you look at this particular passage, what you can see here is that God looks at the world very differently than men. When men look at it, men only sees that in a good world where God is good and He presides over a good world, there should only be good. There should not be any evil. There should not be any poverty. There should not be any pain. There should not be any suffering. Everything along that line should be weeded out by God because that is the way how we humans look at it. There should be no suffering in our lives. There should be no pain, no disease, nothing at all of that sort because if God is good, then my life shouldn't have any of it in it. But if you look at this particular passage here, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed into his field. But then the evil one comes and sow tears in it, and God allows both of them to grow together. And then 
Furthermore, Jesus is not telling the story here as, oh, the master then tells his servant, go out there, you, and go and pick out all the tares in the field and get rid of them. Burn them as, as soon as you see them. When, as soon as they come up, just go out and weed it out and throw it away. Um, in medicine, for example, a lot of times you would see people uh, often talk about, you know, detecting the preclinical stages of the disease. For example, cancer. If you can detect it early enough, then it is treatable. If you can detect cancer at stage one, maybe it's treatable. Maybe you can detect cancer at stage two, maybe it's still treatable. By the time you get to stage four, well, um, you're, you're a little bit too far gone now. There's only a few options left for you. So. Catching something early enough and being able to weed it out early enough is a way that we human approaches almost every single problem. You should bring your cars in for pre, uh, preventative maintenance because you want to catch the problem before it becomes a big problem. Then it doesn't cost you as much money. You should go and get your health care checkup every single year because you want to catch out the problem before it occurs because it's e easier and, and much more treatable at that stage. However, you, what you're looking at here is that there's a very different mindset here that God approaches the world. I'm not saying that the approach that we take today, preventative maintenance for cars or you know, annual checkup and things like that is not necessary. I'm not, tell, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that that's the way how we human approaches it because we are limited by our capacity to change the outcome of things. God is not limited by the outcome. God is not limited by what we are limited by. And so he approaches it very, very differently. I'm sorry, I'm still reading in the Vietnamese version. Let me switch over to the English version. So that is one of the things that I, as I'm reading through this, I, and I find out a little bit more about tares and wheat and things like that, it dawns on me that God's approach to issues that goes on in this world is so vastly different than the way how we approach it. When the disciple came together and asked Jesus, Jesus, explain to us what your parable actually means. And again, I'm being drawn into, in by that because even the disciples, even the people who were listening to these messages at that time, they perhaps are very familiar with what he's talking about. They are familiar with, you know, going out there and sowing seeds in the field and sowing wheat into the field and watching them grow, perhaps. Maybe they are farmers. Maybe they are people who are taking care of the farms and things like that. Um, maybe they're servants and so on and so forth. And even then, they're sitting down asking Jesus, Jesus, explain to me what it means. Explain to me what it is that you want me to take out of this message. And sometimes I don't do that in my own personal life. Sometimes I just take it, I just read it and say, um, you know, uh, let me try to see if I can figure this one out. Let me try to figure out what it is that you want to, to say to me here. So I just take a page out of what the disciple does and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to take out of this message? How does this message applicable to me today in my life? How, what is it that you want me to, to know about the seeds? What is, what is it about the kingdom of heaven that you want me to understand? Um, I'm not a farmer now. I don't, you know, <laughs> go out there and sow wheat and, you know, get darnails in response. Um, but I do sow a couple of different things in, um, you know, the small little porch garden that I have. And, you know, one of the things that we see is that um, after the rain comes down, all of a sudden the weeds start growing everywhere. <laughs> One of the things about weed is that uh, maybe it doesn't require anybody to plant at all, but it just sprout up, right? The wind carries the seeds around and it just plants them all into your garden. I didn't, I didn't plant any weed at all, and they all grow. The stuff that I grew or the stuff that I planted, uh, they are dead. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, it is, it's, it's very interesting. Um, sometimes we 
Um, and I, I sit down and I, I think about it, and there's a reflection point for me as I was sitting out there watching the rain comes down and see how beautiful the weeds are growing up and how all my plants are being dead. Like, you know, is 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 pretty uh, pretty dramatic. And uh, it comes it comes back to me some of the some of the things that you know um, we often pray. I often pray about. It's like, you know, Lord, it's, it's like a lot of times we. Um, we plant into other people's life. We work so hard to um, to help people spiritually. We do a lot of things to try to help other people grow, and it just doesn't seem to work out. They don't grow. They don't thrive. They all like just leave. They all just go away, and we just don't understand. And, and then in the wake of it, we all have all these other problems that we never planted, <laughs> we never anticipated, we never want any of it. And you know, it's just all sprouting up, it's just all growing and thriving, and it's like, man, it's just problem compounding on top of problem. And we just don't really understand. Um, and, um, you know, so I pray about it, and God says, as a, you know, he's just speaking to me, as the wind is scattering, and as people are leaving, as people are going to other places, as for whatever reason, for whatever condition it is, it is within his will that I shouldn't be troubled, I shouldn't be worried about that, because wherever he blows those seeds, wherever it is being planted, there grows new kingdoms. There grows an extension of his church. There grows other congregations where his works will be done. I'm not, I'm the servant. I'm not responsible for the growing and the thriving of the seeds. Whatever it is that I see, my responsibility is just as the servant here. Take care of the, take care of the field. Go out there and do as I'm told. Don't pull up all the weeds <laughs> that are out there unless the master tell me so. At the end of this, as you can see, um, I know that I'm just going through this very, very quickly here. I'm not going to the very specific things. There is eschatology within here talking about the ends of days, um, but I'm not diving into that too much. Simply t telling us that he will have his reapers. Those are his angels that will come and will harvest and we'll weed out the darnels and put them into the fire and we'll harvest the wheat and bring it into the barn. So what I'm left with here with this message is that sometimes I'm looking at the field that God has planted and I am the servant who is just the caretaker going out there, hopefully that I'm doing my job correctly, hopefully that I'm doing everything that I'm being told to do, water, treat, you know, help it along. If you're interested, you can also read a, a compendium of this particular uh, message. In, um, in uh, Mark chapter 4, also, also talks about how there is, it's, it's a parable of the sower, how the sower goes out there and sows the seeds. And then Mark talks about how he goes to sleep, whether he's asleep or he's awake, whether he does anything or doesn't do anything, the crop grows. Um, and that gives us a different perspective in terms of the field that God has planted, the things that God has wanted to grow, the things that maybe our enemies wanted to grow alongside with it. To God, it doesn't really matter. Today, we can look at our problems and see, you know, how come there are these things in my life? Should I go and I, should I weed it out? I see these things in societies. And I see these things that are happening around me. What should I do? What is it that I should take action with? And I believe that we should ask those questions, and we should ask God, God, what should I do with it? Should I go and I try to weed it out? Should I take matters into my own hand and do whatever I think is good? Or should I wait for your will to be done upon whatever it is? Today, maybe we're facing difficult situations at work, at home, a familial relationship with one another, Maybe we want to be able to repair some of the relationship, the brokenness that are happening around us. 
maybe we're looking at things that are growing and maybe thriving a little bit in our lives that are, is not maybe not what God has intended. God, maybe we think it's not what God has wanted in our lives, and we want to take matters into our own hands. We want to take care of it. We want to deal with it on our own terms. And this particular passage here tells me is that God maybe allows all these things to grow together. God maybe allows all of it to thrive together. The good parts of who we are, and also the bad part. And in the end, he will weed it out. He will be the one who will reap the good part and burn away the bad parts in our lives. <clears throat> maybe it's difficult for us right now to look at the portion in our life that we really want to cut out, but we can't. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's something that has bothered us for a very long time that we can't simply overcome. We don't have any strength to overcome it. We try and we try and we try and we keep on failing. Maybe what that is is a reminder that that is a God-sized job and we need God-sized power to deal with those sort of things in our lives. Maybe we feel powerless and maybe that is what God wants us to know that we need to rely on him to take care of those parts in our lives. I know that sometimes it's difficult for us to look at things that are not so pretty, not so nice to look at, um, not visually, but to think about in our lives. And we want to be able to take a hold of it, grab it, pull it out, use our own might, use our own strength, use our own intellect, use our own whatever it is to be able to deal with it. But perhaps this message here, God is telling us, maybe those portions of our lives, we may be needing to come to him on our knees and asking him to help us. Lord, help me to overcome. Help me to repair this. Help me to fix this. Help me to weed this out. And I believe that that is a perspective of heaven. Heaven is where we are becoming in, in such a close relationship with God that we're dependent on him to help us with the issues that are in our lives, particularly the ones that are so overwhelming, particularly some of the things that are so hard, so difficult, and so challenging that we're saying, where are you, God? Why aren't you helping me with this? Um, I know that my words may be a very small measure against some of the things that you might be going through, but I believe that as we're coming to um, God, I know that I have faith that he will address the needs that we have in our lives. I know that he has the answer there for us, and he, he is just waiting for us to come to him. As we're seeing the things that are blossoming in our lives, we see maybe some darnels are blooming along with the wheat. Maybe we're concerned. Maybe we are troubled. Um, but this passage here, what Jesus is saying, be reliant on God. Be reliant on God. He and his angels will come and reap and separate and determine what is bad and what is good. It is not upon us to have to do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the challenges that you have placed in our lives, Lord God. Each challenge becoming bigger. Each challenge becomes harder. Each challenge becomes much more emotionally attached to us, Lord God. I pray that as each challenge comes to us, Lord, that we come back to you on our knees. Lord, allow us to grow in our relationship with you through every challenge, through every hardship, through every difficulty, through every hurdle, Lord God, allow us to come back to you, to ask you for strength, to ask you for forgiveness, for ask, to ask you for everything that we need, Lord God, to approach it, to see it from your view, Lord God, to see every opportunity as, a group, as, as, a, as an avenue, as a vehicle for us to get closer in our relationship with you, Lord God. I pray that you would allow us to take on the mindset of Jesus, Lord God, as we grow in our faith in you. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.